Hi, Stephanie. Welcome to Movie Junk. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Super excited to have you on. We got the very talented Stephanie Kurtzuba joining us today uh, from Hit Movies, um, like The Wolf of Wall Street, one of my all-time favorites already, The Irishman, uh, two Martin Scorsese movies. And you've been on a lot of hit shows as well, too. You know, Blue Bloods, uh, Grey's Anatomy, and The Good Wife. I can't, can't begin to say how much of an honor it is to have you on. Oh my gosh, you're making me feel too big for my britches. Thank you. <laughs> and um, Stephanie, I mean, definitely I want to jump right into the Irishman, but before I do that, you have a, a career spanning over, you know, 25 plus years. I'd love to hear kind of, you know, what got you started in the industry? Because uh, you initially started in uh, Broadway, if I'm not mistaken. I did actually, yeah. My The whole first, more than half of my career was uh, on stage. I'm, yeah, so I'm New York based and I went to NYU. And um, so New York was sort of, you know, coming from my hometown of Omaha, Nebraska, I sort of settled in New York. And then, so it was, it was clear to me that stage was, was the obvious choice. Um, I always loved film and television, but it didn't really occur to me that I could have a career there because I just started getting theater jobs and just sort of stuck with that. It wasn't until much later, I think in like after my third or so Broadway show that I, um, I, I finally went, you know, this work in six days a week thing is kind of for the birds. <laughs> <laughs> and I had had both of my sons, um, both of them were born during the runs of Broadway shows. So I was like, you know, the really pregnant chorus girl. I'm sure everyone would like, why is that? Why is the big girl in the back? What is that all about? <laughs> and when I, had my, um, when I had my second son, the show closed after a couple of years. And I said to my husband, I was like, you know, I really, I should try and focus more on the film and television stuff because this, I want to raise my boys and I don't want to be gone six nights a week. And um, yeah, and I think it was probably about six months after that, that I was in Wolf of Wall Street. So I was very, very lucky that I sort of transitioned right into the other medium. Were there any uh, kind of movies or, or actors or actresses that kind of inspired you early on? Were there any maybe Martin Scorsese movies? Oh my God, I've been inspired by so many people so much of the time. Um, well, I mean, I have to say, Lorraine Bracco and Goodfellas was sort of unlike anything I had ever seen. And uh, I remember being really taken by her. I've always loved Scorsese films. Um, but, you know, I always, I'm one of the strange, um, <laughs> I think I'm an outlier. I'm one of the few women I know that like really love like Michael Bay films and like action. <laughs> It's a good thing I have two little boys because like we are so into the MCU and everything. So I can I can have cover hiding behind their interest in it and be like, oh yeah, I'm, I just do it because my boys like it. Yeah, Michael Bay is awesome. I mean, just, you know, not just speaking from the Transformers. I love, you know, the Bad Boys movies, obviously, as well. Uh, he, he's taken on a career now doing a lot of uh, producing as well, too. So he's able to do kind of more movies uh, during the year. But yeah, huge Michael Bay fan. Me too. I just, I love a good you know, car transforming and a, an explosion. <laughs> of course, of course. And just kind of jumping into The Wolf of Wall Street. I mean, that movie came out in 2013, you know, obviously starring Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, Jonah Hill. I mean, the cast is insane. How did you find yourself uh, on the role or how, what was the audition process like? It was, um, it was actually super typical of, of what my career has, has been, which was uh, got an audition through my agent and, and was very, very fortunate to um, have connected with the amazing casting director, Ellen Lewis. Ellen has cast almost all of Marty's movies. Um, and she is an, she's just an unbelievable artist in and of herself. And she's also, you know, uh, presents opportunities to people like me to get it, their faces in front of people like Marty. And um, she really believed in me. And so she called me in for it. And sure enough, he, uh, he responded and I ended up in the movie um, playing what was originally the role. Well, it was, her name is Kimmy in the movie, but originally was uh, named Carrie. So I remember that was a huge phone call in my life and in my career. Yeah, no, that, that scene was awesome. I mean, it was a very intense scene. I mean, you had the whole uh, you know, company was in that meeting room and you had that intense scene with Leonardo DiCaprio. 
Um, yeah. I, can, I can just ask, you know, a thousand questions, just kind of what was it like working with Leo? But you, you've had the privilege of working with two really good duos. I mean, you got the Joe Pesci, Robert De Niro duo and the Irishman. And then you, I think that was the first time that we saw Jonah Hill and Leo together. Yeah. And just because that's a Martin Scorsese movie, I just felt like we're going to see that duo because of that chemistry they had maybe in future films. What was it like kind of seeing those two guys together? Well, they're both such, oh my God, they're really both amazing, amazing actors, which I think, you know, I think Jonah's uh, career has has blossomed, obviously, and everyone knows his dramatic work now. But up to that point, he was a little more known for comedy. I guess he had done Moneyball at that point, so people took him quite seriously as a dramatic actor. But just seeing how those two men behaved on set was such an inspiration because, you know, I think that, at least for me, my commonly held belief was like movie stars, you know, were just kind of magical unicorns that just did what they did. So without any preparation or without, any, you know, I just sort of assumed, oh, they're just really great at it. Watching Jonah and Leo uh, prep for that, the stakes couldn't have been higher for both of them. Like they both worked their tails off, you know, and it was inspiring to me to not only get to work with them, but to, to, to witness them just cramming lines and working moments. And Jonah always had his headphones on. It was always like staying in the zone so that he could be ready to go as soon as action was called. And it was, it was, it was inspiring to work with both of them. Was it true that uh, as, as Wolf of Wall Street wrapped, uh, you got the call to do a table reading for the Irishman? You heard that story? Yeah, that is true. Um, Same. So, so yeah, it was, it was crazy. I was completely, um, flabbergasted that they that I, I got this phone call saying Marty's got a new script um, he's going to do a table read of it um, and we need someone to come in and read like all of the women's parts is Stephanie available and I was like yeah so <laughs> I showed up for the reading not realizing that we were at Tribeca Films and I walked in and I was like that's Al Pacino that is Joe Pesci that is Robert De Niro <laughs> and you know, it was just kind of, it was honestly so overwhelming that I think I just sort of went into like survival mode of like, just look at the page, just read the words. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember, and Drew Barrymore was like in the audience, like watching. I was just, it was so overwhelming and amazing. And uh, that's how it all started for me. Yeah. I got the book, uh, I Heard You Paint Houses. I mean, I read the book right here. Um, it's really good, right? It's on. It's it's just like uh, you know, like The Godfather. I mean, the book. Just because there's so much more that you can put in a book, the book's always better than the movie. Oh. And even with you know three hours, I mean three and a half hours. I mean, there's only so much you can put. And um, I was one of those guys that had been following The Irishman for I think it was like eight nine years in development until it finally came out. Yeah, I, I think initially it was supposed to be The Winter of Frankie Machine. It was a different movie that. De Niro yeah. was studying and then it he was, was a different there. property a book completely different yeah that's true yeah. yeah it is that's all true and um and I think that they were if I'm I'm sort of retelling the story that I've heard Jane Rosenthal um Bob's producing partner tell um at different functions but if I can remember it correctly she and Bob and Marty were all on the line with I want to say it was maybe Paramount and they were, you know, basically getting ready to sort of green light the original project. And in the, in the midst of all of that happening, um, Bob read uh, So I Heard You Paint Houses. And he, uh, he just, he soft pitched it to Marty and was like, actually, you know what? I don't think this is, I don't think we should be doing this one. I think we should be doing this one. And when Marty heard Bob talking about how he felt about Charles Brandt's book, so I heard you paint houses. He was like, I knew that that was the next movie we had to make together. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, The Irishman had the most shot scenes. There was some record that it broke. I think it was the most scenes in any it movie. It was, yeah. I, I, believe, I believe it was the most locations of any, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, yeah, I could be wrong, but I know that Wolf of Wall Street set the, uh, set the record for the most F-bombs in a film. And so I'm very happy to be a part of history on both of those. So it beat Goodfellas. I think Goodfellas was number one. And then the Wolf of Wall Street took it, took it over then when it came out. I'm responsible for at least two of those. So I'm really proud. 
<laughs> congrats, congrats. Thanks, man. thank you. Now you you get the role. Obviously, uh, filming was you know a few years afterwards until it finally got into production. You know, now you got the role. You know, what was the prep work like? You know, you're the wife of the main character. No added pressure. But what was that preparation <laughs> like? Um. You know, honestly, I could, I could say it was super stressful. And the truth is, is that I did feel um, a lot of pressure from within myself um, to just, just to be good and to get it right uh, because I was working with these like legends. Um, but, if I, but if I tell you the honest truth, none of the pressure came from actually being on set with these guys. Everyone is remarkably relaxed and remarkably, not to say that they aren't working really hard, but they're just, they're masters of what they do. And they kind of treated me just like I was one of them. So in terms of my prep work, I spent a tremendous amount of time and energy trying to find out as much as I could about Irene. Um, it was just important to me. She was a real person. Yeah. And I wanted to portray, you know, not just an idea of a person, but a real person. So I, um, I was lucky enough to find out through the grapevine that Irene's granddaughter, was working uh, in the wardrobe department on the film. Um, and I, I tracked down Brittany and I just very politely introduced myself and said, I don't wanna be nosy, but, but if there's anything you can share about your grandmother, it would mean so much to me. I had a very close relationship with my grandmother and she and I um, really bonded over that. So I found out a lot of great information from Brittany and I also, I also was really lucky that Brittany and her mother, Connie, allowed me to borrow one of Irene's uh, bracelets that I actually wore in the film. Oh, wow. Which was yeah. so cool. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Cause I mean, you know, the, these characters, obviously I mean, the story, you know, it's more of the seventies uh, and eighties. So like, you don't really have a lot to kind of, there's not a lot of documentation on, on these characters, like, you know, seeing like things that you can physically see. So being able to go to the actual family member, I mean, that's the, the great, one of the best sources and you're actually wearing the real life bracelet. Yeah, and there was, of course, there was an amazing um, family photographs that were shared with the production and, and uh, Christopher Peterson and Sandy Powell, who are the costume designers, shared all their research with me. And so, you know, I tried to build it up off of what I could. There's not a lot of mention of Irene in the book, as you know. Um, and she's kind of, she's a little hard to track down even on the interwebs. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm going to be honest, and it's not just because you were in this scene, but one of my favorite scenes in The Irishman is that bar scene where you and um, Frank, you know, first see each other and then yeah. you walk away and then you give him that little look from the behind the bar. And then Joe Pesci just sees, he feels what's going on and he just gives that line and he goes, things change. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> that, that was it. I love it. it. I know. And that's Steve Zillian's amazing writing, you know, that like he, he, how do you take a book like that and make it a cohesive, even like you said, three hour story, but somehow they sure did. Now, now Robert and, and Joe, I mean, they're one of their mythology of acting is doing a lot of improv um, and kind of, you know, getting the, the final take. Were you kind of privy to that? Did you have to do a lot of improv in your scenes or was whatever was written kind of how you did your scene? Well, we did sort of both, to be honest with you. Um, my, my, in my experience with Marty, Marty is really open to improvisation. I think Marty is, um, he adheres to the script, but I think Marty is in his pursuit of sort of truth and authenticity, which I think is just one of the reasons, one of the reasons why he's probably one of the best filmmakers ever to live, is that he, um, if he needs to throw out the written dialogue to hit at something that's closer to the truth, he's willing to do it. So there was a fair amount of, yeah, we, we stuck to the script and what was written on the page always got filmed. Um, but there were, oh my gosh, if you could see the amount of footage of um, Catherine Narducci who played Carrie Buffalino, yeah. of her and I just, Marty would just put the camera on us and just be like, go. You know, there's an amazing scene that we completely improvised that um, it didn't make it into the final cut. But um, I was I was hoping that it would be on like the director's cut at some point because it's just this fabulous little scene when we're in the we're in a restaurant while the guys are doing the scene where he's making the salad and Joe tells Bob you, you got to do it it's yeah. what you know it's time yeah. um, so maybe maybe the world will get to see that one day. I don't know I hope so 
Yeah, because when they're in the back, uh, you know, making the salad, you're wondering, you know, where the women are at. You know, I was eventually hoping that we would see them take the salad and then sit down, they can eat. So maybe right. that, that scene. So that, that would have been, yeah, I definitely want to see that if it, if it makes it to the director's cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, Catherine Narducci, and I, I loved her in The Sopranos and A Bronx Tale. She's the best wife, one of the best wife moms you can always see in, in a movie. Um, what was it like working with her? And uh, I mean, also too, how many cigarettes did you guys smoke in that movie? Oh my God, so, so many cigarettes. Um, thankfully they were those like, um, what are they like rose, rosewood or something? I don't know, they're the like uh, herbal cigarettes. Yeah. I call them potpourri, it was like smoking potpourri. Um, but oh my gosh, we went through a lot of those. Uh, Narducci, she's, she's, uh, she, uh, Narducci is exactly in person who you see on camera. Like she's hilarious. She's like so unbelievably authentically New York. Like she does not pull any punches. She tell you know exactly where she stands. And I could not love that more about her as a human being. She is, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks in my business who, you know, you're not exactly sure where you stand with them. You know, do they really like me? Don't they like me? What, you know, are they you know, interested in talking to me or are they just being polite or whatever? Narducci is like true blue, completely authentic. She, if she don't like you, you know it. If she likes you, you know it. <laughs> no, absolutely. No, she, she's amazing. I, I love her work. And yeah, Narducci is, she is a tremendous, a tremendous talent and a hell of an actress and a hell of a fun person to be friends with. I got to ask now, because I mean, you got, you know, the, the best, you know, vision of this. I mean, you were the wife of Frank Sheeran. Now that you've been in the movie and you've done some, uh, some research, do you think he actually killed Jimmy Hoffa in real life? I'll be honest with you. I thought a lot about this um, I, because I had to think about it in terms of when I was playing the role, but I, I, here's my personal, my personal opinion for what it is worth. And my, uh, my opinion is no more informed than yours because I think you and I had the same source material to determine from. It makes perfect sense to me, the way that he describes it in the book. And sometimes I think that the simplest explanation is usually the truth. Yeah. And it seems, uh, it seems to me that I don't have a reason not to believe it. I do think that uh, Frank was a bit of a uh, showboater. And I, I mean, I know there are certain qualities of his, and certainly a drinker. So I think there are qualities uh, to his personality that you could point at and go, well, that's why it's not true. But based on just the details and everything in the book, I, I don't feel like there's any reason to disbelieve it. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm on the same boat too. I mean, it's, uh... It's really hard to, and, and you, you know, hear a lot of these interviews that everyone claims they know where Jimmy Hoffa's body is, and they go to the location, and there's nothing there. Um, this this story, you know, seems like it's uh, definitely out of all the stories that I've heard, one that I can actually believe. So, right. yeah. So you don't think he's buried in like the end zone in Giant Stadium? No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think that end zone. I mean, they, I, I thought they went there and they, they looked. They didn't find it. Probably did. There's nothing there. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, I think I heard something just recently on the internet that they have another story on where Jimmy Hoff is. So it's just ongoing. It's just a never ending story on, uh, there's no closure just yet. We we're hoping well, people, we people love a good mystery. Although I really do feel for like the Hoffa family, you know, yeah. never having any kind of closure, but. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my take is, you know, it'd be really good for the family just to get some sense of the dad's not coming back, obviously but just getting some sense of closure. And I'd be interested to hear kind of what their feedback was uh, on this movie. Because I was, I was a really big fan of uh, Hoffa, the movie that came out, I think it was in 90 by Jack oh, Nicholson. Yes, yeah, I remember that film. Yeah, that movie was really good too. So uh, we haven't really gotten any you know, good, good story on Jimmy Hoffa. And when this movie came out, I was like, man, Al Pacino playing Jimmy Hoffa, that's gonna be surreal. Wasn't he unbelievable? Yeah. Wow. I'll, now, just to kind of, you know, on, on my next topic, I love asking my guests, you know, this qu uh, question, you know, what are some of the shows that you're binge watching today? Oh, um, God, since the pandemic, I feel like I've reached like the end of Netflix. I feel like I've binged everything. No, you know what I did? 
I did just binge just the other night. I binged the whole first season. I think maybe there's only one season of Flack, which just came out on Netflix because Anna Paquin yeah, yeah. played my stepdaughter in the, in the film. Yeah. Um, I, I love Anna and I had been wanting to, to see the show and I, it popped up on Netflix the other night and I was like completely engrossed in it. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, no, I'm same with me. I mean, I've literally binge watched almost everything and it's just awesome with the, the content that we're, we're getting with Netflix. It just seems like something's always getting released. I've been watching a lot of the uh, documentaries that just keep coming out. Their documentary game is phenomenal. Strong. Yes, agreed. What do you have any recos for me? I mean, there's a ton. I mean, the uh, the Night Stalker one was pretty good. That one just came out. Um, there was the, uh, the 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 Confession Killer, the one the the guy that said he confessed to like over a thousand murders throughout the entire Ooh. country, and they all happened, you know, right around the same time. And his, his story is uh, is up for debate, but that one was pretty good too. Uh, there's just a ton of them. I mean, once you watch one, you get a recommendation for another. Right. Never ended. I watched the um, the Mormon one. The I can't remember the title now, but it was about right. the bombings in the oh, 80s yeah. in Salt Lake. Yeah, yeah, I did see that. Yeah, I was intense. That one's good too, and then also the Hotel Cecil one. That one's a pretty trippy one. Ooh, I'll check that one out too. That, okay, that one's a pretty good one. Stephanie, are there any uh, projects that you could share that you're working on? Any new movies or uh, maybe another Martin Scorsese movie coming up? Oh, I w uh, listen. I think uh, I think Marty and the boys are in uh, on their way to uh, to do Killers of the Flower Moon, which I think is the next. Uh, they might already be in Oklahoma. I don't know. I think that's they're shooting somewhere there. Um, De Niro, right? And uh, Jesse Plemons oh, is yeah. on that too. Who is another phenomenal actor Love that I loved working with. Um, I do have I have a couple things in the works. I'm that's so silly. I I feel like such a drag being like, I can't really say what it is right now. No, but okay. um, sorry, it's I don't want to get in trouble is what it boils down to. It's another excuse to bring you back in a few weeks or a few months. So, <laughs> Listen, it would be my absolute pleasure. I totally will come back. Excellent. And I, I do want to be respectful of your time. I know you're on the East Coast. I'm sure you've had a long day. I just want to thank you again. This is a tremendous honor to, uh, to oh. have you on one of my favorite movies. Uh, to be able to meet with you and kind of learn, you know, your journey and kind of what it was like. Tremendous honor to have you on Movie Journey. I can't thank you enough. It is completely my pleasure, and I'm so glad that we could connect. Thank you very much, and take care, and hopefully we'll connect soon once we figure out uh, those movies that you're in. <laughs> right, what I can say. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.